such a glorious introduction. Um, I'm feeling very honored to be standing in front of all of you um, this evening. And before I get going, I'd just like to know how many people in this room, with a show of hands, use medicinal plants. I'm going to rephrase this question. Keep your hands up. You've got to keep your hands up. I'm going to rephrase this question. If you had coffee today, you had caffeine, and that is a type of the, um, that compound is an alkaloid, so you need to raise your hand. If you drank rooibos, please raise your hand. If you've ever taken flu medication with codeine, and it's almost in everything, you need to raise your hand. If you brushed your teeth today with mint, please raise your hand. And I think at this particular stage, you probably have about 80% of the room. And some people don't want to admit. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say to all of you is that we all interact with plants on a daily basis. So I'd like for you to join me on a journey which is going to be a global journey and eventually will land back here in Stellenbosch, exploring medicinal plants from around the world, indigenous knowledge, and how science can actually strengthen indigenous knowledge systems. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to define, firstly, where the biodiversity is held in our world. And in most instances, one soon realizes that these regions, which are all down south, are biodiversity rich, but unfortunately, technology poor. However, parts of the world which are technology rich are biodiversity poor. And the biodiversity is basically equivalent to chemical biodiversity. So in other words, areas that have a large biodiversity also have a large chemical diversity, which means that those areas need to be explored for new, novel, therapeutic agents or bioactive compounds. All right, so in the tropical regions, there's a large amount of biodiversity. In actual fact, these regions are considered centers of biodiversification. Vavilov centers of biodiversification, a womb of life, a powerhouse of evolution. Unfortunately, global change as well as deforestation is resulting in a large loss of that biodiversity faster than we've actually tested those plants for their efficacy. And I'm going to go back there. I'm going to go back to that point a little bit later. But while we're still focusing on tropical forests, I'd like for you guys to cast an eye to where we are today, which is the southern tip of southern Africa. And I'd like for you to realize that this is a unique, special region because for its very small size, it has a large amount of species endemism. So in other words, there's a lot of potential in terms of the chemical biodiversity to be harvested in those areas. And we have some unique plants in this part of the world which are not really found anywhere else in the world, for instance, such as the protea. We have wonderful species, bufane, very beautiful, but also very, very poisonous. So our flora is very interesting, but unfortunately, we hardly understand our flora because we have not spent enough energy and time studying that, that flora. So I'd like for us to just 
understand in terms of um, indigenous knowledge systems, what's actually happening, and how many people actually use herbal products harvested in most cases from the wild for healthcare. And it's been estimated that 80% of the developing world is heavily reliant on traditional medicines. And the custodians of that indigenous knowledge are the medicine men, or in Zulu, the Sangomas. They hold this knowledge that has been passed on from generation to generation to generation through oral communication. And I do feel that these medicine men, some people might think that they are very simple. I do feel that these people need to be revered because they hold a global mine of information. And if you infuse or interact that knowledge with technology, it can generate billions of dollars. And that industry has basically been estimated at about $800 billion, which is basically equivalent to the IT industries as well as the petrochemicals industries. I did mention earlier that we are losing these plants before we would, we've even managed to test them, as well as utilize our natural resources in an effective and sustainable way. And one, for instance, can grow plants in tissue culture, basically growing those plants within a test tube or in vitro. And this allows for mass generation of little plantlets, microplants, and those plants can then be used as an ex situ conservation strategy for our medicinal flora. So let's travel now to the Pacific where we encounter such an example. The Pacific yew tree has been utilized as a chemotherapy and it contains a compound which is known as Taxol. Conservationists were very, very worried initially when this technology was being developed because they thought that this would endanger the Pacific yew tree. But through use of second generation biotechnology, which is tissue culture, we've been able to save the Pacific yew tree. And we can basically store that germplasm through cryopreservation or freezing, and small vials of material are being saved, and which means that that, that therapeutic um, chemistry that is available in the Pacific yew tree has now been saved for future generations. Okay, so let's get closer to home. We're traveling towards Madagascar, and here we encounter a species which is probably familiar to most of you in this room, Catharanthus roseus. And this species has been utilized as a model species to unravel the intricacies of secondary metabolism. Plants manufacture secondary metabolites from primary metabolites, they use simple structures to make extremely complicated molecules. And there's communication in terms of the genetics as well as the metabolic pool. And scientists have basically utilized this very simple garden plant as a model to unravel the interaction between the genes and the metabolites. And what I'm trying to get, here, get at here is through s technologies, we can learn so much in terms of our beautiful um, flora that we have 
in the world. Come with me, ladies and gentlemen. Travel right into the kingdom of the Zulu, where we encounter a vibrant culture of plant use. And most of these plants are basically harvested from the wild, transported into urban areas, and then utilized in a very informal economy, which services about 300,000 South Africans and heals about 80% of the black South African population. This is a very large industry. It is an informal industry of herbal trade. It is composed of collectors, vendors, sangomas, and end users, which would be patients. And what my point is, is that nature for many people is still a wonderful pharmacy. However, there are problems with this strategy because it results in destructive harvesting in most instances as bulb material such as this, underground parts would be harvested as well as bark being stripped, almost as tall as me. And these destructive harvesting practices basically result in the endangerment of our biodiversity. But through second generation biotechnology, such as tissue culture, one can basically preserve that germplasm. Our last little stop, the wonderful Cape, where we are today. It is a world of biodiversity. It is a world of contrasts. And it is a world that interacts different cultures. And this shapes and changes the way in which plants are actually utilized by people. So, I'd like for you to come into my world and travel with me into the Natural Sciences Building here in Stellenbosch to find out more what it is that we do in terms of this wonderful flora that is available to us. We have the ability to interact with traditional uh, leaders, traditional healers, and these traditional healers use a holistic approach to healthcare which is different from allopathic medicine or Western medicine. This type of healing takes into cognizance not only the body, the physical form, but also the mind, and also integrates spiritual as well as religious practices to heal the person as a whole. We are also able to interact with farmers, and they basically tell us their problems, and thereafter, we try and address those problems. For instance, some farmers will tell us that they don't understand why these medicinal plants are not growing under very high temperature conditions, or why these medicinal plants are not growing in sandy soils, and we try and simulate those conditions within the laboratory environment in order to try and understand how plants actually function. We are also able to tweak secondary metabolism and alter it through genetic engineering or genetic modification. And by doing so, we alter the chemistry. And when we alter this chemistry, we potentially um, change that chemistry and produce new chemicals which might have therapies for many diseases that we are faced with today. 
And we are able to study this change in chemistry using sometimes quite simple methods, such as thin layer chromatography, and sometimes complicated systems. And by doing so, we hope that we add value to an ancient knowledge system. And we are able thus to then also be involved in generating a vibrant plant-based economy. And I'd just like to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, to say that by doing so, we are able to take indigenous knowledge, strengthen it with science, and hopefully this will lead to new product development, generating a plant-based economy in our country. I'd like to share a few results with you. We've been able to generate a variety of different uh, plant extracts. We've also analyzed material that comes from the wild, which comes from a species known as Salvia africana lutea. This is a type of sage. It grows within um, the Western Cape along coastal areas. And for the very first time, we were able to show that this beautiful sage contains interesting compounds which are far more effective in dealing with Fusarium verticelloides, a fungal pathogen, which causes many problems in the agricultural industry, and show that this sage is so effective, far more effective as compared to what is utilized by the agricultural industry. These compounds are single bioactive compounds, and the extract is basically a suite of molecules which is able to act against that particular fusarium. So we hope that we've been able to discover something new which might be of commercial significance. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to end off this talk by saying that indigenous knowledge is important, it needs to be revered, because that indigenous knowledge informs us about medicinal plants, and these medicinal plants are potentially novel and new therapeutic agents for the future. And I'd like to leave you with the words of Mark Plotkin, where he said that every time a medicine man dies, it is like burning down a library. And for me, this holds very true. Thank you.